Say the weird thing. If life begins at conception, then all males are transgender. Indigenous communities safeguard 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity. Two years ago, the U.S. Forest Service started two controlled fires in New Mexico. That became the biggest blaze in the country in 2022. Controlled burns are an environmental practice with roots in indigenous communities, but the U.S. Forest Service negligence caused a catastrophic wildfire. Over 20,000 people had to flee and over 393,000 acres were destroyed. Just an FYI, if the government burns your house down, you might not be able to do anything about it. FEMA is withholding billions of dollars in aid for no legitimate reason. The government holds the power and responsibility to restore what was taken from these victims. I've added a link to my bio with more information about how you can help them. It's giving tree. It's also giving fucked up because this is what your government is doing to your forest. I'm Patagonia and we created this drag look to shed light on the fact that the federal government wants to cut down 370,000 acres of mature and old growth forest, turning beautiful forests like this into this unless we do something to protect it. Our mature and old growth forests are some of our best allies against climate change. They sequester tons of carbon from the atmosphere, they protect our watersheds, and they are ecosystems for thousands of species. This isn't some private land, this is your public land, and they are literally selling it to the highest bidder and logging the shit out of it, all for profit. Case in point, this one right here. Stand with the trees by sharing this video far and wide. People don't even know this is happening. This graveyard is a serious reminder of what our forests will look like if we don't take action. We need a national rule that protects mature and old growth trees once and for all. These trees are worth more standing. These are my top five baddest white women of all time. Of course, with a topic like this, a lot of people are going to have different opinions. It's going to be relatively controversial. People will have different definitions of what qualifies as bad, and this is my opinion, my opinion alone, really just as to what my preferences of bad are. So you can disagree with me in the comments, but this is my list personally. And here we go in no particular order. Margaret Thatcher. Margaret Thatcher was pretty bad. Uh, she was sort of the Ronald Reagan of the UK. She broke up unions, deregulated multiple privatized industries, and also lowered the taxes on the rich overall leading to just a terrible downfall for the UK's economy. Uh, I'd consider her pretty bad. Mother Teresa, while being known for her charitable work and bringing attention to those ill in less fortunate countries, less than 10% of the money that she received for charity actually went to helping any of those people and most of them lived in pretty terrible conditions so Mother Teresa actually didn't do that much aid. Adam Delphi Lolori of New Orleans, if you don't know who that is, she abused her slaves so badly that she had to flee to France during her lifetime when slavery was still legal in the United States and people attempted to burn her mansion down. She was known for having bouts of rage and taking out gross physical violence upon the people that she enslaved, so also pretty bad. On that same note, Carolyn Bryant Dunham, the woman who accused Emmett Till, which led to his gross torture and death, was originally believed that Emmett Till whistled or flirted at her and that led her to tell men who would go then to beat up and end Emmett Till's life, but we found out more recently that none of that ever happened. He had never even spoken to her. Like in my childhood, I was taught that he had said something, but in fact, he hadn't said anything at all. And she let 50 years go before telling the truth. Pretty, um, pretty bad. And last but not least, Queen Elizabeth II, who benefited directly from England's colonialism. She could quite literally be considered the face of colonialism. More than 700 million people were colonized under her rule. More than 20 countries fought for their independence during her rule, and many of them had to go through brutal civil wars or detention camps installed by the British. And she got to live out her comfortable life as a royal, being remembered as a graceful and respected older woman on the dime of the suffering of hundreds of millions of people so that she could prance around in fancy jewelry. So I would also consider that pretty bad. April, April Fools. Let's talk about NDAs in the entertainment industry. This has become particularly relevant while a lot of people are talking about quiet on set and a lot of the child actors that were potentially impacted by the events that went on at Nickelodeon. NDAs are always a complicated legal thing and I am not a lawyer, but I am somebody who was raised in the entertainment industry. And the reason they're so complicated in our industry in particular is because of a few things. One, most people don't understand how the law works. It's something that most big companies rely on. They know you don't know how it works and they know that for the most part you're afraid. 
Not knowing how the law works is also contributed to by the fact that most people, myself included, who were raised as child actors, didn't even get a formal K through 12 education. Not to say that you like learn the law in public high school by any means, but most people who grew up in the entertainment industry are specifically undereducated. And the second thing, which I think is the biggest thing, is can you afford to get sued? Because just because you're right, doesn't mean you can't get sued. This part is particularly vile because these companies are relying on the fact that you can't afford the legal process leading up to potentially winning a case with them, and they can. Even if you might win in the end, can you afford all of the legal fees that lead up to that point? Can you afford the time away from work and the lawyer that you have to pay for? Because Disney and Nickelodeon sure can. They can afford to stay in litigation for literally ever. Because this is about child actors specifically, you have this like horrible concoction of terrible things working against them. Like, the money that they made as a kid is probably already squandered away by a parent or somebody else in their life because the law doesn't protect people well enough financially. A lot of them still want to work in this industry and know that potentially causing a fuss could ruin any of their chances of doing so in the future. And all of that makes something like, hey, I think that this isn't illegal. You could come forward. Not quite enough to be worth it. I'm literally obese and I'm going to destroy your family. Like, I'm here to eradicate the American nuclear family. I'm going to destroy the sanctity of not only marriage, but the sanctity of so much other shit. Like, I hate sanctity. That's my number one foe in life. It's my main op is sanctity. And I don't do casual sex. We have to be madly in love, married, divorced, and remarried to even think about getting second base. Like, I don't fuck with men who I'm not divorced from. Like, like this is 2024. Like, Jesus. And with great bush comes great responsibility. And I've been trying to tell you guys that. No one wants to listen. It's bigger than the, it's bigger than the bush okay it's bigger than that and i've had four shots of espresso and i'm ready to fight any type of administration i'm not fucking kidding and before you tell me something about my life and myself remember to shut up first and be quiet politician more like shut up you're giving me a belly ache and it make me really upset and make me think about the meaning of life don't stress we'll fuck that bridge when we get to it and if i have a surplus of bones to pick with you it's just not even worth it at this point i'm tired of picking bones i'm not gonna pick a bone for you and yeah i guess what the sun came out and it's 45 fucking degrees and i'm on top of the world i'm on top of the world and i'm inside of the river like i'm off the perfect combination of excess caffeine and fucking river chill like, i'm feeling so good right now <sighs> this is what life is about <laughs> I teach high school English and whoo, the white supremacy runs deep. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at how we write essays. Start with an introduction that includes a thesis. Always cite your sources. Use transition words like however and therefore. These are all made up rules. They're arbitrary. They were created by Westerners in power. In linguistic justice, April Baker Bell calls this the language of respectability or the language of power. There is nothing more 2022 to me than a high school English and literature teacher saying that using a thesis and words like however and therefore are white supremacist when she is in fact white college professors have said two plus two equals four is racist also so i guess everything is just racist breathing is now racist so it really terrifies me that the educators that are bringing up the next generation think that things like citing your sources is white supremacy though it may not look like it i don't really like being disrespectful to people and i will try not to be here but best believe me if that's how you take it that's how you take it now those videos came from a little over a year ago but when i saw them i knew i wanted to say something about them i immediately noticed some red flags firstly that you got this video from libs of tiktok but secondly and more importantly i wanted to know why you paused the video right there it seemed like she wasn't done talking i then tried to zoom in so i could see the original creator's username but i couldn't really make it out so i decided to type in the first few sentences from the video into the search bar that's what i found on your video but then i also noticed that you seem to pause it in a weird place thankfully i could clearly see a username so i went to her page come here let's all take a look at what was conveniently left out of this video in linguistic justice april baker bell calls this the language of respectability or the language of power which got me thinking what if i started my school year with a unit honoring how we talk rather than teaching students how to write properly hmm, now stick with me what if her video happened to be about language and how we view people who speak different dialects and less about citing sources or saying a word being white supremacy. AKA, what if the meaning of the video is different than what these people seem to lead on? Foreshadow, verb, be a warning or indication of a future event. Right before you cut your video, and right after you cut your video, this teacher cites this source right here. Do you think the truth seeker bothered to seek out this resource? Anyway, moving swiftly along, because there is a such thing as dumb questions, I ended up finding this book review for it. But that wasn't good enough, so I ended up finding the entire 149 page book. Oh my fucking God, cited sources. By linking the racial classifications black and white to language, I am challenging you, the reader, to see how linguistic hierarchies and racial 
hierarchies are interconnected, and we'll get back to that throughout this video. I was in the process of reading through chapter one when I realized that this book is based off of a study conducted by the same author, so I figured I'd just go find the study. Let me summarize for you what this study is about. We are all taught growing up in the United States correct American grammar or English, and people who deviate from speaking this way are often viewed negatively with different types of stereotypes. In the 70s, right after the Civil Rights Movement, the term academic language began being used and being applied to the default way in which white Americans spoke English. Even if you're skeptical and you don't want to go over historical literature, this makes sense intuitively. Black people were barred from higher education, so when they came up with the language that is deemed academically acceptable, they were not thinking of black people. And at no point in history have white and black people in the United States had the exact same dialect. There's obviously a dialectical difference. This means that when white people begin school, they're often viewed as being more prepared because their speak is more academic already, as opposed to black students who are viewed as having a disadvantage. All of this has led to even black students viewing the way that they speak as less intelligent than their peers and less worthy of value. This study tests that theory and also provides a lesson plan to help combat some of the deeply held beliefs that many students, even black students, have about the way black people talk. This isn't just some shit that was made up. There was a federal court case about this in the 70s, where Judge Charles W. Joyner issued a decision that said that the school district must develop a program to assist students who spoke black English, due to many things including students incorrectly being labeled handicapped. And while there was no evidence of intentional discrimination, the lack of the teacher's effort to account for the fact that not everyone speaks English in the same way affected the children's self-confidence and ability to learn. So the author conducts a study where the students, all black girls by the way, are to read two sentences and then draw a picture of who they think said it in which way and then give their thoughts about the speakers of those sentences. For example, something like people be thinking teenagers don't know nothing as opposed to teenagers know more than people think they do. Now despite the fact that you could understand what the fuck I just said either way, the students put language B, the second one, as being smart and good, while language A was ghetto, thug, disrespectful, they skip school. Mind you, nothing about the way that you say a sentence determines whether or not you're going to be a thug or skip school. And the failure to ensure that black students understand that just because they say something differently does not mean that they're bad or that they're incorrect in saying it is exactly what this entire study and book that neither of you bothered to fucking look up is about. As a proposed solution, the author does a lesson plan where they have students watch The Hate You Give and then ask and respond to these questions. You can read them if you want. This is not indoctrination or woke let I literally watch the hate you give my freshman year of high school. So no, citing your sources or saying however is not white supremacy. The fact that you can have two equally valid ways of saying something to somebody and conveying that information, but one can be viewed as academic and correct and the other one wrong, stupid, or unintelligent is the white supremacy part because those distinctions were drawn along racial lines. This is why Yuval's content on this topic is so fucking profound because he's been telling y'all when y'all say it's not library, it's library, go back to the library and learn how to pronounce it. You are associating something that majority black people say with unintelligence even though you fucking understood what they meant when they said library. But y'all won't keep that same energy when a British person says aluminium instead of aluminum or when you say comfortable instead of comfortable and he challenges your assumptions about the way that you say everyday things that you don't even catch that you're saying wrong, but you have all this smoke when it comes to things that black people say. But you heard a teacher try to give an example by bringing up however or citing sources, and you just assumed that the woke left is telling you that saying however or citing sources is racist without challenging your assumptions, which is the whole purpose of everything that was here. You guys heard something and then turned your brain off and made a reaction to it. She provided you the source and you didn't even go seek it out. Because fundamentally, you're both reactionaries. You're not going to argue with the literature and be like, no, actually, this language dialectical problem comes about because biologically, they just aren't qualified to be considered a proper language. You only exist to say, look at that thing that they're saying, it's dumb and it doesn't make sense. Cause think about it, really saying this is racist? Uh, uh, uh. It's like conversating with children. In conclusion, if you take nothing away from this video, she looks this incredulous because someone dare asked her to think. Good day. Honest question, genuine question. Why don't leftists care about masking? Why aren't supposed radical, socially conscious people, why aren't they masking? Like, we're in a full-on pandemic raging, disabling, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions. We care about liberation, but not for the disabled. I, I just, I don't, I genuinely do not understand the dissonance. We claim to care about communal safety, but like not about community when it comes to a virus that's spreading and acts like HIV in a lot of ways. COVID, it's a damaging virus. It's truly a damaging virus. And the denial and the passivity of leftist people in masking, I just, I, 
I can't, I can't grasp it, man. Like our government has lied to us about everything, but they haven't withheld things about COVID. Like COVID's the thing that we can trust them on. I'm at a loss. I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm just, I just don't get it.